Hey everybody, <laughs> welcome to Move the Combat. I'm James and here are your hosts, Haley. Hey, what's up you guys? And Kenny. Hey. What are we talking about today, Haley? Today, uh, it is everybody's favorite season. It's spoiler season! So we're gonna go. Yeah, this is like the third set in what, like a month? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> they have Wizards of the Ghost has thrown so much stuff at us recently, we haven't been able to keep up with all the spoilers. But we now have all of the core 2020 spoilers, and we're gonna be going over some of our favorites today. And as always, if you have comments, please feel free to make them in the chat, and I will read them on the air. Especially if they're really dumb and not pointed to what we're talking about at all. Which we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> yeah. but anyways, because yeah. why not? Uh. So, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the Core 2020 spoilers. Uh, for those of you who are somewhat new to Magic, uh, the Core set is something they release for every summer set, and it kind of gives you, like, a good overview of the staples you should be using, um, or that the staples that need to be in standard. So, like, you'll pretty commonly see, like, Negate, which is your blue counter spell. You'll see, like, Shock, which is, like, the one mana red burn spell that deals two damage. Um, you'll see a lot of stuff like that. And then additionally, something kind of cool that I think they've been doing with the core sets is they're putting like some pretty big name resets that are reprints that they're sliding in there. We're getting ley lines back. Ley yeah, lines we're getting ley lines back. back. I'm super excited. That, that that deserves to be talked about. That deserves to be talked um, about. We're also getting the scry lands back, which is really cool. Uh, they're not as good as the buddy lands, but they're still dual lands, and they let you see the next card down. So there's that. Yeah, but the purpose of the core sets, too, is also uh, new players. If you are new to Magic, the core set is a really good place to drop in because they give you a lot of the fundamental cards. A lot of the cards have the rules text on them. When you're reading them, uh, it's just a really good place to jump in. They have five Planeswalker decks that come with the set so that you can choose a color that you think you'd like and build upon that. So it's it's just a really good fundamentals thing that they uh, reintroduced starting last year. Mm -hmm. Yep. It doesn't hurt that uh, all of the precon decks also come with, I believe, one or two packs of the of the set. Uh, you, as far as I know, it's two packs. They two might packs. have changed it. They change it quite frequently. We never really know. Uh, but last I heard, I think it's two packs again. Aren't yeah. there magic open house events tied into uh, to the core set coming out too? Yes, yes there will be one. I believe the weekend of release. Yeah, they they used to be the weekend before pre release. Uh, but they moved them to release weekend to try and generate some more like excitement and so right. it's a more fun time for new players to come in because everybody's buzzing with the release of the new set. So you should check out your local game store. Uh, most of the time they will have free decks that Wizards of the Coast sends you and they're learn to play decks. Yep. So and they'll have people there that'll teach you how to play. The, the, open really house, to the open house is the perfect place to learn how to play for the first time because that's what it's for. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of times at a lot of uh, local game stores, they will have uh, experienced players who play at the shop come in and help teach the newer players uh, because it gets everybody involved. You get to le uh, learn the community that you have, and a lot of times they have really cool promos to give you. And uh, even as a seasoned Magic player, one of your favorite things to get is really cool promos. So we're going to start you on the crack early. Of course. Cool. Uh, yeah, so let's start going over some of the spoilers we got. So awesome. we're going to start today with the probably the most important spoiler, and that is Chandra Awakened Inferno. Yeah, I'm really excited. The core set <laughs> is like built around Chandra's story, so we have a couple Chandras, but the mythic one is quite Insane. Sweet. Insane is the correct word. Insane is the correct word. Uh, she is six mana, four generic, and two red for a six loyalty planeswalker. She has... Um, the ability that this spell cannot be countered. So you play her, and she comes into play. There is no counterspelling her. Uh, her plus two ability says each opponent gets an emblem with, at the beginning of your upkeep, this emblem deals one damage to you. Her minus three says uh, Chandra Awakened Inferno deals three damage to each non-elemental creature, and her minus X, uh, she deals X damage to target creature or planeswalker. If a permanent dealt damage this way would die that turn, exile it instead. So let me understand this. Do those stack? They do. The emblems, yeah. Yep. If and you if you play multiple emblems, they do stack. Yes. Yeah. So and there's no way to her, get rid of them. No. Correct. Her plus two is a clock. Um. A and, permanent and, clock. Yeah, a permanent clock that you can interact with. <laughs> I, okay. um, if you can see the look on James' face, this says it all. Yeah. 
I really like okay. the way Chandra interacts with Nyssa, who shakes the world. Of course you do. Why wouldn't Because you? Nyssa's lands happen to be elemental creatures. And if you can just generate a 3-3 to block with Nyssa and then play Chandra and then wipe the board, you don't lose the lands you're creating with Nyssa. That is true. Um, and Elementals is a theme, like a sort of sub-theme that we've it's, seen along this whole set. Yeah, it's a um, tribe we're getting a lot of support yeah, for in the set. Yeah, we're, we're starting to get some more support again for Elementals, which is kind of cool. And like Kenny said, it does work really well with the uh, the lands that are turning into Elementals. So it just gets better and better. <laughs> and yeah, also that plus two ability, you're basically playing a six mana, eight loyalty planeswalker because she can't be countered. So she comes in. You do her ability. That emblem sits there. And yeah, there's... you cannot interact with emblems, so it is just a permanent counter that gets put on the game. So this is a really good card, like against control, because control cannot take your planes off. Yeah, it's it's a really good game ender for like mid range decks or even super fence decks. Correct. Like the Jeskai control deck that's kind of running around right now will probably be playing one or two of this card. Yeah, I, I know <laughs> we've spent a lot, a uh, little bit of time talking on this card, but she's just. A little bonkers. This is this is what I wanted. This is definitely the type of planeswalker that I have been craving for a while now. Yeah. She she does have her little niche marks with like the, the elemental stuff and and she's a Chandra so she deals damage. That's what she does. Mm -hmm. uh, but she's definitely good and definitely can fit into a few different types of decks when you're playing. Yeah, she's just a generally good planeswalker that happens to work with elementals really well with her minus three. I mean, otherwise, she is just a damage... Like, she's kind of like a machine gun, a little she's bit. She's just a damage machine. She's really good. Uh, and then next, we'll be talking about Cavalier Cycle. We're gonna... Yeah, we have three up here, which is Cavalier of Dawn, Cavalier of Gales, Cavalier of Night. There's also a red and green we'll Cavalier. We'll go over the other two, then, the next time. Yeah. We need to be able to see the cards. <laughs> but uh, Cav they're all um, five mana, with triple their color, uh, and then two. And they all come with a signature uh, keyword. So Cavalier of Dawn has Vigilance, Cavalier of Gales has Flying, Cavalier of Night have Lifelink, and then an ability that happens when they enter the battlefield. Usually it's in sets of three um i believe except for cavalier of night but um cavalier of dawn and cavalier of gales both uh cavalier of dawn makes a three three golem cavalier of gales makes a, a uh draws you three cards and then you put two back down so you brainstorm when it enters play and then uh cavalier of night lets you sacrifice another creature and then it destroys a creature if you uh, target creature and opponent controls if you do uh and then they all do something uh when they die you uh so Cavalier of Dawn uh, returns an artifact or enchantment card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, Cavalier of Gales scries two. Um, and you shuffle it into your library. And then Cavalier of Night uh, returns a creature card with converting that cost three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. And they all have really good stats for their CMC. Yeah. Uh, at least four power and then like at least five toughness. Yeah. And then we should also talk about the red and green one as well. So, the, uh, the red one is Cavalier Flame, uh, it's a 6-5, and it has, uh, pay one generic and a red. Creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and gain haste until end of turn. Its ETB trigger is, uh, discard any number of cards, then draw that many, and when it dies, it deals X damage to each opponent and each Planeswalker they control, where X is the number of land cards in your graveyard. And then we have Cavalier of Thorns, uh, which is a 5-6 with Breach. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you reveal the top card five cards of your library, put a land card fro among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your grave. And when it dies, you may exile it. If you do, put another target creature card from your graveyard on top of your library. This feels like a Titan cycle. A um, it bit. sort of does. I, I think it's sort of in place of a Titan cycle, but the fact that they all have both an enter the battlefield and a dies ability trigger, yeah. and a dies trigger just makes them really good yeah i will say there is one of one cavalier that's not as good as the other five yeah um it's probably cavalier of thorns but they're all solid at least um bodies attached to five mana and uh i think cavalier of flame and cavalier of dawn specifically are going to see a lot of play yeah i think a couple of them will see a little bit of play um mm -hmm. Just they're just good value. I mean, they they're are. five mana. Now, granted, uh, they can be hard to cast because they are triple of the color that they're in. 
See, I think that's a misnomer because with the next couple months at least, like, the triple color is not going to be a problem. Um, not in two color decks necessarily, but in three color decks it might still be a problem. Because we do have a pretty solid uh, mana base right now, at least for the next three months. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I mean, I feel like in any deck where you're playing more than one color, it doesn't matter how good your mana base is, triple of any color can still be a little difficult. Yeah, even yeah, Even in two colors, triple can be a little bit difficult because this is something where it's like you have to have that perfect, like, dual land setup type thing where you can, all of your lands can tap for what you need them to tap for at that exact moment that you I, play this. I like the fact that they're knights, which opens up a lot of interesting... They are both elementals and, and knights, knights. Which opens up a lot of interesting strategies for commander and knights decks. Yeah, it absolutely. Does, yes, and it also adds to the elemental sub theme that we were talking about earlier, how this set has it. Um, you can play all sorts of elemental stuff, too. I just want to say Cavalier of Flame is huge. It's like a 6-5. That's yeah, it's, insane. That's a beast. Yeah. And you can give uh, creatures pumpable. you control pl uh, plus one plus yeah. seven haste until them. Turn yeah, two. if you play it turn seven, you can play it, give it haste, and pump it, and now you're swinging for seven. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. Just a little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they all have got really good value to them. So. Mm -hmm. uh, next. Yeah, Kalia. We got another Kalia. She's not as broken. I don't think this one counts as a kill on sight card, like Kalia <laughs> of the Vast. But uh, Kalia Z and the Seeker is uh, Mardu Colors, so red, white, and black for a 3-3 three, three flyer with Vigilance. Uh, it's a human cleric. And then when she enters the battlefield, you look at the top six cards of your library. You can reveal an angel, a demon, or a dragon card from among them and put them into your hand and then put the rest on the bottom in a random order. So you're going to shuffle up the rest of the cards and just throw them underneath your library. Um, she's a cool value engine if you're playing dragons, demons, and angels. Yeah, uh, I definitely think she could be an addition to the 99 in the Kalia yeah. deck for Commander. Um, she's not a replacement for Kalia. Absolutely. By any stretch I think, of the imagination. You know what I think? I think they're two very, very different decks. I think they could be two very, very different decks. I think you can be combine them into one deck, but yes, they would be two very, very different mm -hmm. decks. Because Kalia uh, of the Vast is specifically, uh, she, she doesn't need to have like a good mix of Angels, Demons, and Dragons to yeah. be good. You could just play a straight tribe with her. You could just play demons like or angels, angels or dragons. dragons. Uh, Kalia Zenseeker kind of wants a good mix because she gets one of each. Potentially. You, potentially. I think this could make a cool commander deck. I think yeah. this could I make a cool commander deck. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, she is a three mana three three with flying and vigilance, so that's yeah. really good. Oh yeah, no, don't get me wrong. I'm by no means like saying that this is a bad card. I'm just saying like when you compare it to the original Kalia, it's, it's, it's kind different. of that thing that you have to get out of your head because it is different. Yeah. Um, I think this would also be very good with effects like Helm of the Host that can make non-legendary copies of her, so you're just continuously shuffling through your deck every turn. Like Helm of the Host, yeah. your pieces. stuff like Eldrazi Displacer, Pan Harmonicon. Yes. Or uh, any way that you have to, like, bounce her continuously mm -hmm. um, would just be fun. Cloudstone Curio. Yeah. I think, I think generally she's just a solid card, and she will see some play. Um, I think we might see a different type of Kalia deck in Commander emerge. Or we might not. Or it's we'll really just, see, just see turn to World Gorger Dragon. I don't Yay. know. I'm, I'm kind of interested in it. I think she's super interesting, and I think she definitely has a place somewhere. Yeah. yeah. What do we got next? Next up, we have uh, Kethis, the Hidden Hand. He's so he cool. Is Abzan colors, so white, black, and green for a 3-4 Elf Advisor. Uh, he says that legendary spells you cost cast one generic less to cast, and if you exile two legendary cards from your graveyard, until the end of the turn, each legendary card in your graveyard gains you may play this card from your graveyard. So that's an interesting, like, uh, sort of recursion thing with legendaries, and he also is a legendary cost reducer. Yeah, this card feels like Carador. Like okay. A more, a more um, focused Carador. Yeah. Okay, I can, uh, I can see where that. Where he's letting bit. you, but but then his reach also extends into like the legendaries, legendary instants and sorceries. Yes. Where Carador only cares about creature, Kethis, as long as you is legendary, you don't care. Yes, this um, would reach the legendary sorcery cards from your graveyard. So, for example, Primeval's Glorious Rebirth. Yeah. It's a legendary sorcery. As long as you have a legendary on the field, you can bring back all of the legendaries from your graveyard, which would be really right. nice, especially if this you're playing some sort of legendary tribal deck. I mm -hmm. would assume so. 
Yeah, yeah. and uh, it, it feels kind of like a um, a, a sorcery almost. It's an activated ability. Um, yeah, a little, kind a of like Yarmol's yeah. vile um, vile offering, where you are paying a cost to get a whole bunch of stuff, and then that's it. I, I the huge tax for exiling the two legendary cards can be difficult to meet unless you build the deck with a, he a very large density of legendary cards. Yeah, so like I said, if you're building some mm. sort of legendary tribal thing. Um, but it is a pretty decent way to recur stuff if you've got two legendary cards in your graveyard that aren't doing a whole lot for you or they're not useful that game. You just toss them and you get back the stuff from your graveyard that you do need. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. And if you have ways to get uh, legendary cards from or cards from exile back into your library or back into your hand or exile... Yeah, that stuff could like, be pretty cool, too. Stuff like Rift Sweeper. Mm hmm Next up is... Kaikar Winds Fury. So Kaikar is a bird wizard, legendary creature, for one and Jeskai colors, so blue, red, and white. He's got flying, and then whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. Then you can sacrifice the spirit for red mana. Huh. <laughs> yeah. um, so a lot of... Mm -hmm. there, there's a couple there's so many different ways you can go with this but i think kai cars ends up being a storm commander yeah i would definitely say so some sort of storm or spell slinging yeah uh, any variation of that yeah yep. this is pretty uh mm -hmm. cast a bunch of non-creature spells make a bunch <laughs> i don't know of tokens, why you're looking at me <laughs> sack sack a bunch of spirits for more mana to cast more spells make more spirits really you don't say yeah i don't it's know it's got fun stuff it i don't know do. why you're looking at me like that I definitely I like feel like this card. is more of a, a Kai commander card. card. Yeah, absolutely. I this... like this. It's in Jeskai colors, too. It is it in is. Jeskai colors. I really like this card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this has a lot of really fun potential with some sort of Storm or Spellslinger deck. There's, I, I think he's a combo facilitator the way that like Urza Lord High Artificer is. Yeah, I could see that. Which, by the way, uh, one of the people I play with had, yeah. had that deck. Yeah. Uh, at our game session, and oh my god. Right? It's so much fun. <laughs> it's Fun is not the word I'd use for. <laughs> yeah. Dominated everyone would be the word I'd use. Yeah. Words I'd use for it. But yeah, so so back to this. Yeah. Yeah, it does what it does. It's storm spell slinging, just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, next up on the spoilers list, Omnath, Locust of the Royal. I love this card. It uh, makes me so happy. So now we, we have Omnath, but now in three colors. Just gets more colors. He just gets more colors. Eventually, he'll be five color, and you can play five color jank with him. That'd be great. And when that happens, you know damn well I'm gonna make that deck. <laughs> uh, Omnath Locus of the Royal, though he is uh, one generic, and then one of each team or color, which is green, blue, and red for a three-three uh, legendary elemental. When he enters the battlefield. Uh, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control, and whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on target elemental you control. If you control eight or more lands, you get to draw a card. So, I really like the way he synergizes with cards like Scapeshift. I really like the way he synergizes with a lot of things. <laughs> He's... He feels like Landfall, and it makes me happy. He kind of does feel like Landfall. You definitely, like, he'd be good in, like... Even like some elemental lands matter, yeah. all the fun stuff. Yeah, all the all the fun teamer stuff. And it doesn't hurt that a lot of the cards that turn your lands into creatures also makes them elementals. Oh no, that does not hurt at all. <laughs> yeah, because now you now you can put plus one plus one counters on them as yeah. well, and you're just you, your reach just extends with this. And then not only that, but if you control eight or more lands, you get to start drawing cards. Yeah. Which yeah. is just insane. So I think the potential here is uh, really good, and I think it could be a lot of fun. I, I really like this card. <laughs> it makes me happy. The cards that give you things when you do other things are a lot of fun to me. Uh, those are the best kind of cards, because <laughs> they're, they're more value than just the, the card itself. Yeah. And any card that adds more value than just itself onto the field is definitely uh, worth at least looking into. And it doesn't hurt that Omnath's a fireball. Nope. When he comes into play. Yeah, nope. he just so, deals damage. So if you find a way to like animate all your lands, turning them into elementals, and then just play Omnath, someone's probably dying. And he's an elemental, so you can bump him. Yeah, it's at least one damage when he comes into play. Yeah, it's that's stupid. <laughs> Alright, moving on. Okay, Rien, Angel of Rebirth. 
We got another angel, guys. That's a thing. And she's Naya colors. So she's two and red, green, white for a 5-4 flyer that says other multicolored creatures you control get plus one plus oh. And then whenever another multicolored creature you control dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next beginning of the next end step yes this uh, feels like feather before we keep talking about this i want to just she, make it clear that this is a buy a box promo card so it is still completely standard legal you're just not going to see it in, in the packs, main set yeah. itself it doesn't come in the packs uh it will just come as a separate mm. buy a box promotional card uh and is but, it still guaranteed foil with buy a box promos as far as i know yeah i think so so it's gonna look amazing yeah, as far as I know, it's foil. I have uh, yet to actually see it with my own eyes, uh, but when we do, we can confirm. Mm -hmm. There's, I don't think there's any reason for them to change that now. Yeah. Um, that's what they've been doing. But, uh, yes. Yeah. But regardless, she's worth talking about. She's Absolutely. a 5-4 flyer that buffs your multicolored spells and then also recurs them. So The creatures, at least. Mm -hmm. So there is a creature in Magic called Safi Eric's Daughter. She is a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, and you can sacrifice her to bring a creature that was brought sent to your graveyard that turn and put it back into play. So if, say, Rien dies with Safi in play, you sacrifice her, and then you get Safi back. And then you do it again. Yeah. So it's like Feather with your legendary cre or your multicolored creatures. Yeah, this is just a lot of a lot of fun. A lot of multicolored stuff. Uh, it's just a good. Yeah, it's a cool card. It's a cool card. I think it'll be interesting. I think this is the first time we've had like a Naya angel. Yeah, I think you're right. I'll have to think on it for a minute. I don't have that information at the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, just multicolor matters, mm -hmm. and also multicolor recursion for yeah. creatures is pretty cool. Uh, next up is. Vivian Arcbow Ranger. So we get to see more of our beloved Gideon. Er, Gideon? Gideon? Didn't he die? Our <laughs> beloved Vivian, who was uh, introduced to us in Core 2019, is when we uh, first saw her make her debut. And she has quickly become an interesting character. And we've seen a lot of her since then. Yeah. Um, but this one specifically... Uh, she's one generic and three green mana for a four loyalty planeswalker. Her plus one distributes uh, two plus one plus one counters among up to two target creatures, and they gain trample until end of turn. Her minus three uh, says target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker, and her minus five says you may choose a creature card you own from outside the game, reveal it, and put it into your hand. She's good for a number of reasons. Okay, so her plus one gets damage through. Her minus three is re really good removal. Mm -hmm. And then her minus five is a wish. Yeah, you get you, something out of you your library. You get to make your sideboard uh, is now your wish board. And it's a creature toolbox now. It's a creature toolbox. Uh, so when it says um, creature card you own outside the game, it typically is referring to your sideboard in, uh, in a tournament format. Uh, so your 15 card sideboard is your 15 card creature toolbox with Vivian, and that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, what I will say though is that Vivian Arcbow is not good when she's be when you're behind. Uh, no, she is she's, not. She's she's similar to Dom like uh, three drop Domri and uh, Karn, or not Karn, sorry, um, Nico like Bolas. Karn, God. where are you getting Karn Nico from? Bolas, Nico Bolas, Dragon God. They're very good when you're ahead and not so great when you're behind because there's they Vivian and Domri both care about you having creatures in play. And then if your opponent isn't knocked back too far by um Ugin's or Nico Bolas's plus one or minus three, uh then they don't care about the card being in play. What I do like about her uh plus one ability is it's comparable to the uh the old Johnny ability yeah um except this one i think is slightly better uh because you can put both of those plus one plus one counters on one creature yeah or you can distribute them amongst two creatures uh but if you only have the one creature uh, and you you want to get the damage through or you just need to make one thing taller with the trample 
Uh, this is really cool to do that because now you can do that. Whereas his ability, like, made you put like one on mm -hmm. two separate creatures. Uh, so I think this one's plus one ability is superior to that. Absolutely, and like the mono green decks and the green X decks are, are gonna, gonna love, love this, this card. card. They're just gonna love it because They're all the creatures are big enough to care about Trampler. Usually, at least like three power. Yeah. And putting it to five just makes it backbreaking. And then being a, it's not even a fight. It's that creature deals damage equal to its power and it to target creature planeswalker instead of like this creature fights another target creature yeah so you're dealing damage to something without your creature taking damage in return which is really nice yeah uh next up we have bag of holding mm -hmm. this card's really cool uh it kind of reminds me of bomat courier a little oh, bit oh yeah a little bit yeah, a little okay. bit okay uh, so it says it's a one mana artifact, and it says whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. And then you can pay two and tap it to draw a card, then discard a card. And then you can pay four and tap to sacrifice Bag of Holding and return all cards exiled with Bag of Holding to their owner's hand. So it kind of stores up all the cards that you discard, and then you can sacrifice Bag of Holding to get all those cards back. Correct. I think that it is interesting in the fact that uh, it requires you to discard them. Yeah. In order to get them back later. Uh, so it's kind of interesting uh, that not only can it work where if you discard your own cards, but uh, discard is kind of like a strategy in standard right now where a you little make bit, your yeah. opponent discard their hand. So this can help like mitigate that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, cool. You're going to like tear my yeah, hand apart. This is a really, I'll just get it back later. This is a really cool board option against decks like Esper. Yes. That care about that run like four copies of Thought Erasure and like three copies of Duress. Yes, very much so. So it, it's really interesting. There's also a couple cards in the set that care about you, disc like in M20, that care about you discarding cards. Bag For of sure. Holding is one of them, and I believe we have another one uh, that we're talking about. We have today. another one that we're talking about in a, a little bit on the line, but yeah, I think this is super interesting that it helps mitigate that because it makes the player who's making you discard. Think a little bit harder about yeah. what they're going to make you discard, because you can just see it later. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's also card draw. Yes, it is I, also looting. I think it's kind of cool to see a and d property in a magic right? game. That's, that's <laughs> I mean, that's just my 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 total out of off the wall oh, take yeah. on it. Oh, yeah, but sure. But I wonder if they'll ever incorporate any other items, or we'll see, like, Morden Kaiden's spell stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I also really like the flavor text on this card. It says there's no prepared, like over prepared, and that says everything you need to know about what a bag of holding is. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I think it's interesting because we uh, was it earlier this year or later last year we saw the Ravna, uh, Guilds of Ravnica yeah. D and D adventure come out. So yeah. you, you saw magic cross over to the D and D portion of Wizards of the Coast. So now it's more interesting to see uh, a little bit of that D and D aspect come into magic itself. And it doesn't mean that, like, they're shoving D&D &D down your throat. It's just a really nope. cool thing that they're incorporating for the people who get it. You know what? If we, if get, a, if we get a giant green creature called Tarask, I'll be super happy. Or a giant blue creature that's a, or a Mind Flayer. Yeah. Or, 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 or a, a Beholder. Yeah. That's black. <laughs> yeah. I would, I would flip over that. It's just cool, because if you get it, you get it, and it's cool for you. And if I'd you make, don't, then it's still not a big deal. Yeah. If that happened, I'd make a five-color D&D-themed commander deck. Absolutely. <laughs> Next up, anyway, moving on. Uh, we have uh, another Chandra that came out in the set because there are three in the set itself. Yeah. One at Mythic, one at Rare, and one at Uncommon. Uh, we have Chandra Acolyte of Flame, who is the rare Planeswalker. Um, she is one generic and two red for a four loyalty walker. She has two zero abilities. The first one says, uh, put a loyalty counter on each red Planeswalker you control. Her second one creates two 1-1 one, one red elemental creature tokens, and they gain haste, and then you sacrifice them, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. And her minus two says you may cast, target, instant, or sorcery with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard. If that card would be put in your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. That's pretty good. It's cool card. She's pretty good. She's going to definitely see play in Super Friends decks. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think the flashback is the main reason to play her. Just getting like your yeah. your deafening clarions and your shocks and your lightning strikes back to just replay over and over oh, again. Oh yeah, I think she could be pretty good in like some of the mono red decks because there are cards like we'll talk about the leylines later, but there yeah. are cards that are making burn less 
prevalent of a way uh, to win. Yeah. If you if they give themselves tech proof, um, so this kind of helps like fill in that gap there where it's like her zero ability creates two one one red elemental creature tokens and they gain haste. So it's not costing you anything to put more pressure creatures on the board. Because mm-hmm. you're just going to lose them at the beginning of your next end step anyway, so you might as well get more creatures swinging in for damage. Yeah, absolutely. It's not costing you anything. And additionally, because you see a lot of the red decks already playing Chandra, her other zero ability is putting loyalty counters on each red plane's walker you control. So if you're playing multiple Chandras in your deck, this isn't necessarily bad. I could also see like a mono red planeswalker deck that's like uh, Tybalt, Chandra, 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 Sarkin. Sarkin? I already have one of those in the works. I would just like to play that out in the universe. Because um, I'm excited. I think that'd be such a cool, cool deck. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of like a big mono, red deck. Mono red, like, Super Friends. Mm-hmm. It definitely has an interesting ring to it. Yeah. Super Friends aggro. Aggro? <laughs> Psh. Just you wait, Kenny. I'll make you eat your words. <laughs> and by eat your words, I mean I'll make you eat your... <laughs> Okay, so um, leaky tire in here, I think. <laughs> no, I just think this is a really cool card. Yeah, uh, it is. artwork's cool too. The artwork is cool. I do like how the Chandra artworks for the for the M twenty set. They're kind of progressive. Like the uncommon Chandra is like Chandra when she first gets her spark, and then Chandra Acolyte of Flame is when she's learning to control everything, and then Awakened Inferno is when Chandra's like a master of fire, and she's just like lighting everyone up. Like when she became like Torch of Defiance. Yeah. Yeah. Super cool. I think it's very interesting, and as like this game just has such amazing artwork sometimes. But that's such a cool thing to do with yeah. like moving her up like through the levels with the different rarities, mm-hmm. and you can kind of see that like in the walkers themselves yeah. too, in the power levels of them, which is really cool. Uh, next up, Bishop of Wings. Did so somebody we... say Angel Tribal? I think someone said Angel. Tribal. Someone said Angel Tribal, and it makes me happy. It's uh, Bishop of the Wings is a human cleric. It's double white for a 1-4, which is a huge body on a two-mana card. It's a big butt. That's a really big butt. Uh, and it says whenever an angel enters the battlefield under your control, you gain four life. And then whenever an angel you control dies, you create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. So we do still have Resplendent Angel in the format. And we still have Lyra Dawnbringer. And Shalai. And Shalai. And, uh... And Aurelia. Yeah. And Rien. Oh, no. And... <laughs> no, there's too many. Angel Tribal's gonna be a thing, isn't it? Oh, it's totally gonna be a thing. It's it makes me so thing, happy. Isn't it? It's gonna be, like, red-white. It's gonna be perfect. Or even just Mardu. Yeah, no. Seraph of the Scales. Somebody, somebody in development was like, I don't think Angel Tribal has enough pieces yet. Let's give them one more. <laughs> so this, uh, this is good, because, uh... Your life gain is from your angels. So yeah. it's like every time you play an angel, gain four life. And what does white like to do? Gain life. Can we just talk about how well this synergizes with Resplendent Angel? Oh. So yes. Resplendent Angel says whenever if, if you have gained five life on your end step, you make a 4-4 four, four flying vigilant angel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm slash groaning through this entire card. There's just so many. <laughs> it makes me so happy. <laughs> And not only that, but the angels, like, I understand that they're only replacing themselves with one white spirit creature tokens with flying, but their angels are replacing themselves when they die. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, brought back. It's a double white instant spell. It says choose up to two target permanent cards in your grave that, are, that were put there from the battlefield this turn and return them to the battlefield tapped. This is an interesting card. We haven't seen this effect in white for a long time. I think the last time we saw it was like Second Sunrise. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, it's it's white recursion, for yeah. sure, uh, which is something that there's not a ton of. Actually, fun fact, back in the day, white was just behind black in recursion. Was. And it still kind of is, just not in standard. Not no, standard. actually, yeah, because Soren and Johnny. That's newer, though. You're, you're starting to see white come back in Recursion, where we didn't have a ton of it. Okay. Uh, a ton of it in the recent mm-hmm. uh, recent past. We haven't had a ton of white Recursion, but you are starting to see more of it pop up again, which is definitely a good thing. Yeah. And this is, this is very interesting, because it's two mana uh, that's just recurring two things. Yeah. That, uh, we're put into the graveyard this turn. So the instant makes it really good because it could come um, either from 
you attacking or from you blocking. Or a forward wipe or something. Or, or if, a forward wipe. Or... or if you decide, or if your opponent decides to sweep, you're like, cool, I'll get these creatures back. Exactly. So this is just, yeah, it's got multi-facets. If you need to use them to block, you get them back. If you use them to attack and you lost yeah. them, you get them back. If they board wipe, you get them back. It's just kind of like a really and decent two mana. And this does say permanent, so it also includes artifacts, enchantments, and planeswalkers. It does. And which lands. Is really nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Okay. Next up. Uh, Drawn from Dreams is really cool. It's uh, two and two blue. And you look at the top seven cards of your library, put two of them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. This is a deep dig. Yeah, this is interesting to me. It's a really deep dig. Um, I hesitate because it's a sorcery with the mana cost that it has, but it also digs through seven cards, so I'm it's, a little conflicted on this card. I want to say this is kind of a more fair dig through time. Possibly. Because dig through time get looks lets you look at the top seven and then you pick a card yes this lets you get two it doesn't cost a bajillion mana and or with delve yeah and it's not instant speed and i think yes. the sorcery speed is what allows them to allows let the developers kind of let you have the two cards instead of one yeah and you are looking at extra cards as opposed to like if you're using like the Ascanta, mm -hmm. like when you flip yeah. that ability um so you are looking at seven and getting two of them as opposed to like four and one. Yeah. Um, it's just it's I can see I can see it, but also part of me is still hesitating because I'm like, that's four mana I don't, that I'm playing at sorcery speed, you know what which I think? is like I don't know. I don't think this is a turn four card. It's not I a, think this, oh, is, this a, is definitely not a turn four card. I think this is a turn four or a turn eight to turn ten card. Yeah. When you run out of gas, you get to look at the top hand, like a full hand of cards, and then pick the two best cards and put them in your hand. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, this is this would never be a turn four play, in my personal opinion. Uh, but yeah, I think this card has potential. It's definitely interesting, yeah. at the very least. That and the art's really pretty. Oh, the art's super pretty. I like the quote, too. Yeah. Yeah, from a sea of uh, infinite possibilities, our choices create the future, Mu Yan Ling. Yeah. Which definitely seems like something she would say. I feel like yeah. Mu Yan Ling is kind of a zen master. Yeah, exactly. Just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> next up, we have uh, Elvish Reclaimer. It is one green mana Ooh. for a 1-2 Elf Warrior. Uh, Elvish Reclaimer gets plus two, plus two, as long as there are three or more land cards in your graveyard. And uh, if you pay two mana and tap it, you get to sacrifice a land and then search your library for a land card, put it onto the battlefield, tap, then shuffle your library. That's this, interesting. This card will see play in Legacy, Modern, and Standard. Potentially, yeah. It's a turn one Knight of the Reliquary. Like I said, potentially, yeah. <laughs> Turn one Knight of the Reliquary in a relevant creature type. <laughs> Kenny, I'm already agreeing with you. Don't make me do it even more. I think I've agreed with you too much today. I've hit my limit. Yeah, so I, have to, with that. I have to put some level of disinterest in my voice, otherwise people might think I like you. Aww. But this lets you get any land card. So any land card. Oh, yeah. Which is a big deal. And then uh, it cares about the lands that are in your graveyard. And it can be a one-drop... 3-4. It can be a 1-drop 3-4. It can be a 1-drop 3-4, and that's kind of scary. It can feel like a goif, yeah. It, it, yes, just a little bit. But yeah, <laughs> also, you get to sacrifice a land card, search your library for a land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. So this does several things. It, it potentially... Thins and shuffles. It thins and shuffles. And it's a huge beat stick. It's a huge beat stick. You can get rid of a land that you didn't need for a land that you do need. Mm -hmm. So if you're playing multi -co like multiple colors, like a three-color deck, yeah. and then like for some reason, say you're playing Teamer and you're not seeing your blue, this allows you to just go like, uh, screw this forest, I'm going to go get my blue source. Or if you're playing like Gates and you just want to spam Gate ETBs. Or you're playing Gates and you want to spam Gate ETBs. If you're playing, this, this has so much potential in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very... Very interesting and a super relevant creature type. Can we also just say that it being a one two beats almost every other one drop right now? They're yeah, because like it's got a bigger ones. butt for a one drop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This this is gonna see something. Very cool. Next up is Embodiment of Agonies. We got a baby demon here. It's uh double black and it's one for <laughs> for a zero zero with flying and death touch. And then Embodiment of Agonies enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter on it for each different mana cost among non-land cards in your graveyard. This will have like three pages of rule text, rules text during its time in standard. 
<laughs> I'm saying this now because it, for example, uh, two black is not the same as one black black. It's also not the same okay, as black black black. I would never black. play this card just because of how confusing it is. <laughs> so, I, this, this card's really interesting to me. Uh, it's act, really interesting to me. It, it is, isn't it? Oh, it's yeah. interesting. I also actually think confusing. it's better than a lot than than it looks, just because it sees each different oh, yeah. mana cost, yeah. right? It's it also brings an interesting way to deck construct too. Yeah, because you if you are playing this as like one of the main pieces in your deck, you want it as many different converted or different types of mana cost as you possibly mm -hmm. can. So, like for example, yeah, the the two generic and one black, or one generic and two black, or one generic or versus one, generic one black and, or yeah like double this, black yeah you could put so many different mana costs into your deck and it just adds like a whole nother layer that kind of make my makes my brain hurt but also <laughs> makes me a little excited and also like a little weary yeah it also has i have a lot of feelings you have a lot of feelings i have a lot of feelings not all of them good not all of them bad just very intrigued feelings it also has flying and death touch it also has flying and death touch which are like two of my favorite abilities yeah and a flying death toucher, a one-one flying death toucher is kind of worth three mana sometimes. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've been known to play quite a few flying death touchers in my time, including but not limited to owning like sixty-four vampire night hawks. Don't ask me why I have so many; it's none of your business. <laughs> Baleful Strix. Well, I remember you always asking me for vampire night fox. Yeah, vampire night fox. He's my favorite. Uh, but yes, also baleful Strix. Just. Things with flying and death touch on them make me happy, and this is just such an intriguing and uh, ability to me. Yeah. Because it specifically goes out of its way to explain that it's like it's not like if you've got a one drop and a two drop and a three drop and a four drop. It's no. like any combination. Any variation, of, yeah. Yeah. And this is gonna take some like you're gonna have to start spreading out your graveyard because we see a lot of interesting graveyard stuff in this set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, next up, Blood of Tears. It is a six drop sorcery <laughs> for four generic and two blue. It says return all non land permanents to their owner's hands. If you return four or more non token permanents, you control this way. You may put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield. It's a flood of salt, is what it is. Salty tears. <laughs> now, this is kind of a better Rivers rebuke. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of is. This is just like. Also, like, if you can um, minus Narset down twice, then bounce her with Flood of Tears, and then replay her for free to reset her. Oh. There's so many potential things that you could do with this card. One, it's it's a temporary board wipe. Yeah. For sure. But then also, if you're wiping enough things, you get to put of stuff yours, yeah. onto the field. Of and yours. And it's, just not, yours. it's not necessarily the thing you picked up, either. No, it could be either. anything in your hand. You'd be yeah. like, oh, look at this Zakama that was in my hand. Yeah. And now what it's was a play. that? Blightsteel Colossus? Oops. Whoopsie. Whoopsie. <laughs> yeah, no, this is this is very interesting. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. It has potential. Next up. Next up is Glinthorn Buccaneer. This is the other card that cares about discard. Mm -hmm. So Glinthorn Buccaneer is a pirate. Yay. Uh, it's one in double red for a 2-4 with haste, which is really good. Mm -hmm. And then whenever you discard a card, Glinthorn Buccaneer deals one damage to each opponent. Then he's got an activated ability that says one in, two, one in a red, discard a card, draw a card. And activate this ability only if, it is only if Glinthorn Buccaneer is attacking. So it loots when he attacks, and then also each time you discard to deal one damage to each opponent and if you mix this with the bag of holding and then also like any other discard stuff like this this yeah. you just play a bunch of loot effects basically and you yeah. kill your opponents by looting by looting <laughs> where's the looter scooter when you need it <laughs> pop to cop to but i mean it's a three drop two four so mm -hmm. it's kometa sized it's kometa sized with yeah. haste correct yeah. that's nuts it's definitely not bad. I'm not complaining about it. I think it's a pretty decent card. Yeah. Because it's got just a static ability that happens. So it's dealing one damage to each opponent whenever you discard. Mm -hmm. And also it's each opponent, not just target opponent, yeah. which makes it better. Pairing this with cards like um, Tormenting Voice. Mm -hmm. Joe's going to be happy. He, may, he has a Minotaur Tribal Commander deck. No, yeah. I think this is a discard, like a self-discard deck that this wants to be in. 
And that's, that's true. super intriguing. Yeah. It's a hellbent deck. Yes. <laughs> Next up, uh, Golos. Golos? 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 Golos. I'm going to call him Golos. Correct I, me later if you want. for me. I think this is your five-color D&D commander. Uh, Tireless Pilgrim. He is a <laughs> five generic mana for a three-five legendary artifact creature scout. So many. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a land card, put that card on your battlefield, tap to then shuffle your library, and you can pay uh, two generic, one white, one blue, one black, one red, one green, and exile the top three cards of your library, and you may play them this turn without paying their mana costs. Fun. It's interesting. It actually kind of feels like Narset. A you little think? Bit. A little bit, because it's able to, to play cards for free off the top of your library. Uh, yeah, but you're also paying for you're those also, cards that you're playing. I, I'm saying like, I'm not saying it's as good as. So, here's the <laughs> way, I've got mixed feelings about it, because on one hand, it's the top three cards at the library, and you may pay them without paying their mana cost. So that's cool that you're getting the three cards, but also, unless the total mana cost of those cards equals at least seven, mm, good it's... Point. It okay. could potentially be a flop, but it could also potentially be really good. He reminds me more of Joda than of than of. Also, keeping Narset. in mind that Golos kind of gets you to seven by himself. Oh, I'm not saying he doesn't. So he's five mana, then you get a land off of him, right. and then you play your next land. Right. There's seven. Yes, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm also <laughs> saying that if you paid seven mana... They better each cost at least they seven better, mana. All, all oh, three of those it. cards combined better at least cost seven mana, or I just wasted seven mana. Yeah. Right. So he's got his upsides and his downsides. He's pretty interesting. It's also what cards with scroll rack, like scroll rack are for. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But, I, I mean, you're not going to have a hit every time. <laughs> yeah, It's absolutely. just one of those interesting abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, next up. Graph Digger's Cage. Oh, God, it's this card. back, guys. It's back. It's back, back. So Graph Digger's Cage is played all over Modern. Because graveyard decks are a pain in the butt. Uh, but it's one mana for an artifact that says creature cards in graveyards and libraries can't enter the battlefield. And then players can't cast spells from graveyards or libraries. So this does two really important things to two really big decks in this format. Uh-huh. Uh, first, it shuts down uh, Command the Dreadhorde. Uh-huh. And then it also shuts down Jumpstart. Uh-huh. It makes me happy. <laughs> I hate cards like this. The no cards? I love the no cards sometimes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't this also go against Experimental Frenzy? N yes, it does. Oh my gosh, it shuts down six It shuts down Mono Red as well. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, if I do recall correctly, and I do believe I recall correctly, uh, Experimental Frenzy plays cards from the top of your library. It does. And, and this is a one-drop artifact... That says you can't cast spells from your library. Yeah, it looks like standard decks are going to need some uh, artifact removal now. Mm. Just a little bit. <laughs> With cards like Graph Digger's Cage and uh, Bag of Holding. I may or may not be planning mm. something. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, we Ooh, have night. Uh, night of the Ebon Legion. Uh, it is a one black for a one two vampire knight. He has an ability that uh, is two generic and one black, and he gets plus three plus three and gains death touch until the end of turn. And uh, at the beginning of your next end step, if a player lost four or more life this turn, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on him. Hooray! It's a one drop that just keeps getting bigger. This and card bigger is super and dangerous. Bigger. And also, he gains Death Touch and becomes a 4-5. So, so his activated ability is repeatable if you have the open mana to do it, and nothing else to do with that mana. So you could make him, like, a 3-4 and then, like, a 6-7 with Death Touch, and then he just gets a counter, and he's bigger for the next turn. I gotta rebuild my Knight Commander deck. This card is insane. I know. So good. I, gotta think, rebuild it. I think we're gonna have three months of Knights being really, really good. Yeah. I think it has potential. I think this is a really well, good this and card. another card that's that we're talking about. Yes. Yes, and I know what card you're talking about, and yes. I think this could be really fun. It's like a really low-to-the-ground, aggressive black-white yeah. deck. Turn three, you're swinging for a four, with a 4-5 with Death Touch. And right. possibly with like a Knight of Grace or a Knight of Malice, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it just has some really good potential there. 
It's yep. really good. <laughs> um, Next up. Our ley lines, ley lines, they're back. The ley lines are back. So only one of each of them, only one in each color though. So it's not all of the ley lines. No, we're getting a bunch of the important ones and then one new ley line. Yes. Uh, so the three here are ley line of sanctity, ley line of anticipation, and ley line of the void. They're all four mana, two and then double of their respective color. And all ley lines say if it's in your opening hand, you play it for free at the beginning of the game. Um then they all do something different. They're all enchantments that just kind of statically give you an effect. Yeah, so Leyline um, of Sanctity gives you so Hexproof. So Sanctity gives you Hexproof. Anticipation lets you play spells with Flash. And then Leyline of the Void says, if a card would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. These cards are all over Modern for a very good reason. They're super interesting. That and having them in your opening hand it makes a huge difference. Yeah, so Leyline of Sanctity is one of the reasons I said earlier that, like, Mono Red, if it's going against a white deck, uh, the burn option might not be as viable and anymore. And Esper. And Esper. Yeah. And Eddie. it stops discard, too. Mm -hmm. So this will definitely be interesting uh, to incorporate these into Standard. We're going to see lots... It's been a hot minute since we've had Leyline yep. in Standard. We're going to see lots more uh, cards like Mortify, Knight of Autumn, um, D-Spark... Things that get rid of enchantments because there's a lot yeah. of really powerful artifacts and enchantments specifically that are. That I think are coming yes. Out. I think we're gonna see a standard in which we have to put back in enchantment and artifact hate into our decks mm -hmm. because they are definitely becoming prevalent. Yeah. Uh, and then in addition to these three ley lines, we also get uh, red ley line of ley line of combustion and the green ley line of abundance. Uh, Yep. Ley line of combustion says whenever you or at least one permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, ley line of combustion deals two damage to that player. And then ley line of abundance says whenever you tap a creature for mana, you get to add an additional green. And then if you pay six generic and two green, you get to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control. So because of the amount of mana dorks in the elf tribe, I feel like we're going to see ley line of abundance in there. Potentially, yeah. And then ley line of combustion is just kind of like aggro's best friend. Just just a little bit. Just a lot. Just a little bit. <laughs> it's like, you don't want to interact with my things? Cool. Shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, the ley lines, I think, are going to add a really interesting element to the standard yeah. that we currently have. Mm -hmm. they, they just add another thing, especially when you have the chance to play them for free on your opening hand. Like, you can begin the game with it on the battlefield if it's in your opening yeah. hand. And that is nuts. Yeah, I can see a whole bunch of, like either white control deck or a white base control decks or or mid-range decks just having four ley line of sanctities in their sideboard yeah against control or burn and they're just like i just have four ley lines hey look ley line and then the burn player's just like okay i guess i don't do anything now <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically it, it can be fun yeah it, it'll definitely it's... be interesting to see what the ley lines do to standard if, yeah if anything because there's been a couple cards I definitely think we'll see Leyline of Sanctity, but and I... And Leyline of the Void, at least. And Leyline of the Void, but I've also thought that we were going to see a few more of the cards in the last core set that we never really saw mm -hmm. see play. So, this will be interesting to see what happens with these. Yeah. Uh, next up is... Lotus Field. Yeah. So, we kind of got a fixed reprint of Lotus Veil. Um, yes. <laughs> it's a hexproof land, which is fantastic. It means it can't mm -hmm. be targeted, except by your stuff. And then when it enters, it enters the battlefield, tapped. And when it enters the battlefield, you have to sacrifice two lands. And then you can tap it to add three mana of any one color. Yes, and just for reference, uh, the card that a lot of people are comparing this card to is called Lotus Veil. And Lotus Veil comes into play, and when it, co or it comes into play, and you sack two untapped lands or bury Lotus Veil, and then you can tap it to add three mm -hmm. mana of any one color to your mana pool. This is very similar, very comparable, uh, potentially. A little better? Uh, maybe. Here's, because here's you can why tap I the say, lands. Here's why I say potentially a little bit better. So I understand that an inch is battlefield tapped. Um, but it does have hexproof. Yeah. And additionally, uh, it doesn't specify that you have to sacrifice two untapped lands. Yeah, you can tap so the lands you can, for mana. So you can tap the lands for mana and spend the mana that turn and then sacrifice two tapped lands and bring this in tapped. Uh, so... I think it's got the potential. And I think this is the very first land we've seen that has Hexproof. 
guess, yeah. potentially. Except so. for maybe uh, Lumbering Falls, but Lumbering Falls only has Hexproof when it's a creature. Yeah, so I think this is a super interesting land, and I think it's pretty good, and it's, I think it's going to see play. It's going to see a lot of play. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in, like, two-color decks. Yeah. I, I think, think so. three-color decks can't spare it, really. Um, it's super flexible, but it, the three mana, they're, a lot of the three-color decks right now, at least, are playing a lot of multicolored spells, and getting three of any one color is not where you want to be. What? I think even that, like, in mono-color decks, too, mm -hmm. that this is super strong, because it's, like, at the end mm -hmm. of turn two... Oh, absolutely. Or at the end of turn three, I should say. I mean, you're sacrificing the two lands mm -hmm. that you already used this turn and then you're putting it on and then you untap and you add a mana. You know what I really like? This card with cards like um Crucible of Worlds. Yes. I think I think this yeah. this land is super interesting and a lot of people are talking about it yeah. whether in a good way or a bad way. So, <laughs> I guess we'll see what happens there. But Lotus Field definitely uh on my list of stuff that I would like to see play. Absolutely. Next up. Marauding Raptor. So hey. we got some dinosaur love this set as well. Ty, this one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Marauding Raptor is a 2-drop two 2-3, two, which is a huge body on a 2-drop. It says creature spells you cast cost one less to cast. And then whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, Marauding Raptor deals 2 damage to it. If a dinosaur is dealt damage this way, Marauding Raptor gets plus 2 plus 0. Oh. This is fantastic in mid-range decks. Yes. One thing that uh, worries me about this card it, a little bit is it does have a combo in standard currently yeah. uh, with a card called Polyraptor that if you play Polyraptor in this card, the game just ends in a draw automatically. It does. Because um, so, there's no way to really win off of that combo right now. Well, here's the thing. So here's why it works the way it does. And when you play those two cards, the game instantly ends in a draw, and this is why. In Magic... People often refer to things as infinite combos, but due to the rules of magic, nothing can actually be infinite. You have to be able to quantify it in some mm -hmm. way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um, because of mm -hmm. the way that Polyraptor and Marauding Raptor are written, it's not a may ability, it's a must ability on both ends. Yeah. So you have no physical way to quantify this combo. It just ends. So it just ends the game because it, there, there's no way to quantify it, therefore it's illegal, yeah. more or less. Um, so I'm, this card, I like it, I think it's cool, I just really hope we don't see a bunch of Marauding Raptor and Polyraptor decks running I don't, around, because somebody's gonna be that troll, and you I know think, it. I think there will be someone who is that troll, but I think most people that are playing at the high level events at least, mm -hmm. want to play to win. And oh, you, don't you definitely want to play to, wanna play to win, you, you don't want to play and to draw. And that's I just, why they won't run the Polyraptor uh, yeah, when you're playing combo. at high level events, absolutely not. My worry is in like the FNM events. I don't think anybody really wants to be that troll unless they really. Oh, you know someone's gonna be Kenny. You uh, well, unless they know really, it. really want to be that troll. I also yeah. want to say that Marauding Raptor opens this really cool design space where the creatures that you want to play after Marauding Raptor need to have at least three toughness. Oh yeah, this definitely is a, is an interesting space. Yeah. So you have to. It, it feels like. It wants to be in a mid-range deck, not really a low-to-the-ground aggro deck. That is correct, I yes. think it's the perfect addition to Ty's... Uh, Dinos? Dino. Absolutely. Dino yeah, I think I think this card will be interesting, but like I said, that combo makes me... And, it, and I know that not everybody's going to play it, and I know when you see it, it'll be like a one-off yeah. or a two-off, but still, it, that, that makes me a little nervous, and the fact that they're allowing that to be in the design space like that, I'm like... I think what they thought is that because Magic is a game, um, players want to either... They, they, they want to play for multiple reasons, but most of the time it's either to win or to have fun. Correct. Or a combination of both. Correct. Right. And but I'm worried about people like, oh, I'm losing, I'm going to play this Polyraptor I've been holding on to. I draw. Yeah, I just think it's super interesting that they put these in the same design space like that. And they don't intend to do... Because they've commented on it. They don't intend to do anything about that combo. They're just yeah. like, well, it ends in a draw. It ends in a draw. So I think that's interesting because that makes the game non-interactive. And that's exactly what they set out not to do. <laughs> so, like I said, I know you're not going to see a ton of it. And you're definitely not going to see it on a competitive level because somebody wants to win. But it might pop up at a few FNMs and piss a few people off. 
Yeah. So yeah. we'll see what happens with that. But and then we'll... that comes down to the community. Oh, absolutely. You know? But this also is one of the things that like well, no. makes me want to look in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if like they're allowing stuff like this to be in the same design space, only for three months. It is only for three months. I'm just saying this. This could be an interesting scenario that we find yeah. ourselves in. If if this is the stuff that they're bringing into yeah. the format, I will say though, outside of like Polyraptor, this card's a little pushed. Yes, outside of Polyraptor. What do you mean by pushed? Um, it's like too efficient for what it does at its mana cost. Oh, gotcha. You know, yeah, so it's it's, a... it's it's not double red. It's not red green. It's red and one, which means you can play it in a bunch of different decks. Yeah, it's not super wise. taxing on your mana. It, um, it's pretty it's, efficient. It's got a huge body. And then it reduces all creature spells by one. I wouldn't call it a huge body, but for, for a two-drop, two it's got a decent body. It's a two-three as body. opposed to just being a two-two. That's like uh, um, Sylvan Sylvan Awakener body. Hmm. Yeah, but uh, we'll just have to see what happens. I think this is an interesting card, and I think it's put into an interesting design space because of yeah. the fact that it deals the two damage, and we'll just have to see what it does. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have Night Pack Ambusher. Wolves are getting is... some love. Wolves are getting some love. It is a 4-drop, <laughs> 2 generic, and 2 green for a 4-4 four, four wolf. It has flash. It says other wolves and werewolves you control get plus 1, plus 1. And at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast a spell this turn, create a 2-2 two, two green wolf creature token. This kind of reminisces like the Innistrad Eldritch Moon stuff for me. Yeah. Um, it also doesn't hurt that this is a 4-4 four, four with flash. Yeah, no, not at all. That doesn't, that doesn't hurt. <laughs> that kind of rewards the flash play style by like, oh, you're not gonna play things on your turn. Cool, have a wolf. Yes, it's That's a three-three exactly wolf. What it does. Technically, two, technically, oh, yeah, 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 it's yeah, a three-three. Yeah, three. It's a two-two wolf, yeah, 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 but this is a right, this is right, a right, lord. Right, right, right. Also, so. this card with Tolson your wolf wolf blood or friend of wolves. Yeah, I think uh, this puts an interesting aspect into uh, standard again. Yeah, you could you could potentially do something with wolves. I don't know how good it'll be in this exact moment, but... but it's interesting for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, and like I said, I like the fact that it's a little reminiscent, because it also includes werewolves. Yeah, it does. So, it's definitely, it, it's interesting, and I will be interested to see if it sees play in Standard at all, or if we just see it mostly in other formats, because I, I think, think we'll see it mostly in other formats. I think it being a 4-4 body with Flash gives it some leeway in Standard. Yeah, I think it does give it that some That creates way. more creatures. Yes, because it does create more creatures, and that's why I think it, we'll see it, it has potential. Yeah. Uh, next up. Scheming Symmetry. Whoa, this card's this, the artwork on this really bothers me. It's super <laughs> cool. Um, it's one mana, and then you choose two target players, and each of them searches their library for a card, and then shovels their library and puts that card on top of it. This is, I think, pretty good in Standard, and also hilarious in Commander. Uh, yeah, this card is definitely interesting. Um, I think it's pretty good in standard. It's just a one drop that allows both players to search for the card that they need. Yeah. So. It, but if you have a way to interact with the top deck of your opponent's library. Oh yeah, for sure. Like in a mill deck. Uh huh. Like yeah, scheming, yeah. scheming symmetry. Let's go find a thing. Mill it. Yep. Cool. This, this one <laughs> makes your opponent think about what they're grabbing, and two, it it's. It's exactly as the artwork describes. You're both holding a knife to each other's neck. Yeah, so you it's can great. Both do something about it. Um, next up is Shifting Ceratops. It is a four drop, two generic, two green for a five four dinosaur. It cannot be countered. It's pro blue, and if you pay one green, it gains your choice of reach, trample, or haste until the end of turn. This thing's super pushed. Uh, just a little bit. Just a lot. Uh, the fact that it has protection from blue means it's protected from all of the Teferi Planeswalkers that are running rampant. <laughs> yep. Uh, so it can't just be bounced. And then just paying the green, you can give it a mess of abilities to just mess with your op opponent's combat math. And it's a 4-drop 5-4 that can't be countered. Yeah. Oh. I think that's all we have to say on this card. Yeah, it kind of just speaks for itself. It's really good. Ouch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next up. The Temples. The temples. We are, are we getting five this set? Yes. Uh, there are ten, like the du like the, uh, all the other dual lands, uh, one for each pair of colors. But we are getting Temple of Epiphany, Temple of Triumph, Temple of Malady, Temple of Silence, and Temple of Mystery. They are all enemy colors, so blue, red, white, red, 
um, green, black, white, black, and blue, green. And all temples, when they enter the battlefield, you scry one, and then they just produce, they enter tapped, and then you can, they tap them to produce one of either of their colors. Yeah, I think the temples are good. Uh, I've definitely used them before, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll be interesting to see how these interact with the new London Mulligan rule that's going to be effective uh, via Core 2020. I don't think it's going to interact too much because the cards go to the bottom of your library. Yes, except here's why I say this. So, uh, you mulligan, Yeah. you drop your two cards, turn one you play a temple, and you're still fixing your draw. Yeah. Yeah. So that... you, you picked the hand that you wanted to keep, and you're still fixing your first draw. So I think it definitely something to be said for it. Okay. I think it has a space, and I, I think it'll be interesting. personally think this is going to slow down standard a bit when the buddy lands rotate. Oh, definitely at when least, rotation happens, this at least will like slow like it down a, turn. a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I'm just things are going to be a little slower. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying in the current standard that we have it in, it adds an interesting effect. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the L London Mulligan being introduced. Uh, but yeah, post-rotation, it's going to slow things down a little bit, so I'm interested to see how they make up for that. Yeah, so we're going to see Temples and Shocklands together. Yes. Which is going to be kind of nice. Uh, next up, uh, Voracious Hydra. This card's really It cool. kind of looks like a Pokemon. A little bit. Okay. It's not just me. <laughs> Uh, so it's X and two green for a zero one Hydra with Trample. Uh, it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, and when it enters the battlefield, you get to choose one. You can either double the number of plus one plus one counters on it, or it Yeesh. fights target creature you don't control. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also play the. It's a zero one, so you can play it for zero with without like losing it. Yeah, you can just if you just want to dump a blocker in. You you could just dump a blocker in for two mana. Yeesh. Uh, or you could potentially make it like super. Here's my 24 super big. 24 trample. Nah, uh, more like <laughs> I pay five for it. Here's a 10 10. The, uh, <laughs> you know? the, the ramp flash decks, I think, will have a good time with this card. Absolutely. This card is hilarious and it's removal on a stick. Yeah, it's removal on a stick or just like a super, super, super big dude. Yeah, but I mean, for those X spells, it's competing with Hydroid Crisis. Correct. You know, and you don't. I think what we're going to see is we're going to see some combination of the two, but Hydra Crisis is going to be played more often than this. Probably, because it gains life and draws yeah. cards. I think this will see play in like the ramp decks specifically, but not mm -hmm. so much the flash decks. I think it'll be interesting to see how this card gets split, because I think it will still see play. Um, but I also think it could see play depending on the matchup. Maybe. So Just fight the thing. Fight the thing. I think we're going to see this in like Gruel. Potentially, yeah. For, because probably. they yeah. like to run a bunch of riot mechanics that put counters on creatures. So you can just, like, put a counter on it, double it, or put a counter on it, fight it. Right. You know? Right. Or just give it the, the huge, a the huge aspiratious Hydra haste, because it's got trample. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next up. Apostle of Purifying Light. Yes. This is a really cool card. And I think we need to talk about protection being brought back. A little bit. Uh, so protection is not Hexproof or Shroud. No. It says, basically, um, this creature can't be blocked, targeted, dealt damage by, en enchanted, or equipped by anything of the color it has protection from. Yes. Or the card type or creature type or whatever. whatever. it has protection from. Yeah. So, basically, it prevents all damage that would be dealt to it by that color. It cannot be blocked, cannot be targeted by anything of that color. Uh, and then you cannot, like, if something gains protection while something of that color is enchanted to it or equipped to it, that enchantment or equipment falls off. Yes. And that's important to note. Apostle of Purifying Light, though, is a really interesting card. Um, I think it kind of falls under an interesting uh, kind of white control um, aspect. Yeah, because black has a lot of the removal, so for this card specifically being mm -hmm. a uh, two-drop, one generic, one white for a 2-1, yeah, um, human cleric... Uh, it, it lets you also pay two to exile a card from your graveyard, or from a graveyard, so you can respond to, like, a sword ability going off targeting creatures, like, cool, exile it. Yeah, and this also, um, it protects itself from a lot of relative, relevant removal in Absolutely. the format. It doesn't protect itself from, like, the burn, obviously. Well, yeah. Um, but it's, like, Assassin's Trophy, Cast Down, Grass's Contempt. Um, a lot of the yeah. relevant removal. Yeah. Even, like, Bedevil can't hit it. Yep. So, mm -hmm. and it's definitely in an interesting space. 
Um, and it, uh, speaking to protection again, they have probationary, probationarily brought it back. They're testing it. They're they're testing it as an evergreen word again, which should prove interesting in the future. Because it's not hexproof. It is not hexproof. It is different. Yeah. And it definitely puts an interesting uh, design space into standard. Yep. I haven't seen that word since I fourth think, edition. I think they're trying, I think with M20 specifically, they're trying to roll back a lot of the stuff that we've seen in older sets. Because mm -hmm. a lot of things that we have seen from a, all of those older sets have kind of been cycled out. Right. And they want to bring them back to test them to see if they're still viable in the current state that magic is in now. Correct. Right. Uh, next up, Blood, Blood for, for bones. bones. This card's really cool. It is. It is a uh, four drop, three generic, one black sorcery. It says, as an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice a creature, and then return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, uh, then return another creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So you can sacrifice the creature to cast a spell, get a creature back, then put the creature you sacrificed back in your hand. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, I, I feel that this is interesting. It's kind of a better rise from the grave. A little. Okay, I can see where you're bringing that from. So, I, I mean, it, it requires you to cast a cre or sacrifice a creature instead of paying five mana. Mm -hmm. But you get, you effectively get to reuse, like, an ETB of a creature you already, already played, like Ravenous Chupacabra. Yeah. Um, and then get a, a huge creature from your graveyard into play. Yeah, so, yeah. You're, you're bringing something back onto the battlefield, you're getting another ETB trigger, you're reviving something huge, and then additionally you're pulling something back to your hand. So, it's pretty good. Yeah. Next up. Corpse Knight. This card is so cool, and it's going to see play all over in like the black-white aggro decks. This is just so much reach. Yeah. Um, it's a 2-mana two 2-2 two, two, zombie knight, so it's got like two of the most relevant creature types yep. right now. And then whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses a life. As... This makes creature decks want to go wide. I know I said it three times. I gotta rebuild my knights deck. Because, <laughs> this card's really good. Because with the commander that pumps out knights, boom. Yeah, one Ariel. DPS for yeah, one DPS for everybody. Yeah. Yep. I also want to talk about this card with uh, um, Call the Conclave, or not Call the Conclave, uh, March of the Multitudes. Okay. Yeah. So just have you it just down, make a, you just and you're like. You pass your turn, cool, I'll march with the multitudes for like seven. Mm. Yep. Yay. <laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> or like Tristani. <laughs> Next! <laughs> we have Bry. Uh, it's a two drop instant, one generic, one red. Uh, this spell cannot be countered and it deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker that's white or blue. This feels like a direct attack against a fairy and I'm here for it. <laughs> it kind of is. Um, also Lyra. Yes. And Shalai. Yes. And. and yeah, anything I'm, white or blue. I'm here for Can it. Can we just talk about how the art is like an, an exploded chicken? It's hilarious. Just the legs is left. Dinner got a little overcooked. <laughs> yeah, it just feels like a direct, direct attack, and and I'm totally here for it. And that's also all it really can't be countered. Like I said, a direct <laughs> attack. This is like screw your Teferi, screw your Lyra, yeah. screw your Shalai. I hate your board. Get rid of it. Yeah, End of absolutely. Moving on. Loaming Shaman. So Loaming Shaman's a 3-mana three 3-2, three and when it enters the battlefield, uh, target player shuffles any number of target cards from their graveyard into their library. So it's like you get to restart Is all it, over again. Yeah, but it's also really good for you against mill decks. So it's like yeah. somebody's trying to mill you out, you're like, whoopsie, here's my whole deck back, have fun milling me or, again. Or after, like, grinding forever... You could be like, Lomi Shaman shuffle my graveyard back in the libra into my library. Yeah, have fun, continue to grinding. Well, you've got about 40 less cards than I do. Yeah. It's great. Uh, next up, Noxious Grasp. It's a two-drop instant, one generic and one black. For destroy target creature or planeswalker that's green or white, you gain one life. Not as good as Fry. No, but it is just destroy. But it is just destroy. So... I kind of like Fry better because it takes care of the Teferi problem in Standard right yeah, now. Yeah, but Noxious Grab uh, gets rid of Oketra. But this also gets rid of Oketra. <laughs> Temporarily. But, yeah, but I mean... But you gain a life off of it, or just like any creature or planeswalker that's green or white, so you're... It also includes Teferi. 
Yeah, that's that's also what, I was about to say, it's very has white in it. I, was, I, I, still, was like, Do I, I still say feel anything? Like, <laughs> no, it does still have white in it. Uh, I just, I think that Fry is more relevant. Fry is more relevant? Yes. But I feel like this is going to be our replacement, um, at least out of the board, for cards like Cast Down. Yeah, probably. For sure. Mm -hmm. uh, next up. Unchained Berserker. Uh, Unchained Berserker is one and a red. Uh, it's got protection from white, and then it gets plus two plus zero oh, as long as it's attacking. Uh, it's a one one. So this is also a direct attack at Teferi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like they heard us when we said like, please don't put eight Teferis in standard, and they were like, here's eight Teferis. Here's eight Teferis, but here's your answer to those eight Teferis. <laughs> so we're riding pretty with that. Yeah. Like, red, black, aggro decks are going to have all the answers for Teferi ever. Yep. All right, next up. Vampire of the Dire Moon. It's one black for a 1-1 one, one death touch with lifelink, and it's also a vampire. Nice. It's a solid one drop. It's got death touch, so it's it trades It's got death up. touch and lifelink for a 1. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like vampire synergies, like, this is one of the best payoff cards you can get because <laughs> it just gets so much from its two static abilities. Yes. And that's Very all nice. that really needs to be said about this card. Mm -hmm. Mu Yanling Sky Moo's Dancer. Back. So Mu is back in like an actual set this time. I'm really upset we didn't see her in War of the Spark like we did. Yeah, with where was Jiang. this bitch at? Yeah, um, she's <laughs> she's. We're, I, I think we're also getting like a de like a dedicated flavor for what kind of planeswalker she is. We're starting. We're. St I think we're starting to finally feel her out as a character. Yeah. And what so, kind of ability she does. Yep. So Mu Yan Ling is a three mana planeswalker, double blue and one, with two loyalty. Um, she has a plus two that says until your next turn, up to one target creature, gets minus two, minus so, and loses flying. She has a minus three, which creates a four, four blue elemental bird creature token with flying, which is huge. And then she's got a minus eight that says you get an emblem with islands you control, have tap, draw a card. Yes. I think she's a very good... Uh, in a specific type of deck, so she's definitely one of those uh, planeswalkers that has flavor deck yeah. that she belongs in. But I also think that she doesn't like the flavor. She's not forced into the flavor. Like she could fit into a control deck just fine. Oh, potentially. As long as there's a bunch of islands to tap. Yeah, as long as there's a bunch of islands to tap. Otherwise, her if you're not utilizing a planeswalker for all its abilities, you're not properly utilizing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes standard gets to break that rule because standard. Can be kind of a quick format now, but it can also be kind of a slow format. So I think it just depends on what yeah, you're playing. Yeah, it, it, synergy isn't a, as much of a big deal in standard as it is in formats like Legacy and Modern and Commander. Correct. Uh, just because the cards individually need to be able to compete with one another. Yes. And you're not trying to go off at like. Correct. Uh, <laughs> next up, we have a uh, similar case with Soren Imperius. A Blood Lord, he is a three drop for two generic, one black for a four loyalty. His plus one says target creature you control gains de death touch and lifelink until end of turn. If it's a vampire, put a plus one plus one counter on it. He has a second plus one ability that says you may sack a vampire, and if you do, uh, Soren deals three damage to any target and you gain three life, and his minus three says you may put a vampire creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So I think this is the only Planeswalker that was severely hammered into his lane. Because he just cares about vampires. You play vampires or you don't play this card. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be fair, he grows your vampires. He lightning helixes, mm -hmm. which is really good. Or technically Soren's Thirst, I guess. Yeah. But, <laughs> but then he lets you cheat mana costs while still staying in play. So you could put it down on turn three, minus three him, then put down like a, uh, um, a Sovereign, which is a four yes. mana card. I find him slightly uh, reminiscent of the Black Planeswalker that we got in uh, 419, which was Liliana. Liliana. Yeah. And she was very much about the vampire synergy. She was all about zombies, yeah. Zombie synergies. Yes, thank you. I was reading the word vampire in front of me. Um, <laughs> she's all about the zombie synergies. He's all about the vampire synergies. Black's doing what Black's doing, and that's that's where we're at. Yeah. I think he's a very useful card, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and three mana for four loyalty is a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next up. Dread Presence. Oh, that's so, creepy artwork. Right? It's so cool, though. Yeah, um, I know. I'm not complaining. <laughs> so Dread Presence is our Black Nightmare for this set. You only ever get one a set, because that's what happens. <laughs> uh, but it's 4-mana uh, 3-3, three, three. and then whenever a swamp enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Uh, you either draw a card and lose a life, 
or Dread Presence deals two damage to any target and you gain two life. I think he's pretty good for what he does. Absolutely. Yeah. I think this in like a mono black control deck would be really cool. With like um what's the land that taps for each basic swamp you control? Oh, uh Cabal Stronghold. Cabal Stronghold. Yeah. So like if you're able to jam a whole bunch of land, uh, swamps into play. Yeah, I think this uh could be really fun. And it definitely is like black lands matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, swamps can... matter, but yeah. Well, swamp... swamps matter. It can do some interesting things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next up, uh, Villas Broker of Blood. It is a big demon. It's a big boy demon. <laughs> it's a uh, five generic man on three black mana for an 8-8 flyer. You can tap one, or, sorry, you can pay one black mana and two life, and target creature gets minus one, minus one till end of turn, and then... Whenever you lose life, you draw that many cards. So this, this feels like Grizzlebrand. Just a continuous. Uh, I'm draw. gonna kill things and draw a lot of cards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this with cards like um, Bolas of Citadel. Pay yeah. ten life for. Pay your life to pay cards, and then you just draw yeah. more cards off Phyllis. <sighs> yeah, your life total is a resource for a reason, and this card 100 percent utilizes. This is going this. in my. My life gain death for sure. <laughs> He's also just an eight drop eight eight flyer, which is big. terrifying. It's big. He's a big boy. He's a big. Mm-hmm. Boy. Next up, eternal isolation. So this is the white removal spell we're going to be talking about today because I think it's cool. Uh, it's white and a one. It's a sorcery, so it's not as good. But you put target creature with power four or greater on the bottom of its owner's library. It doesn't even exile them. It just throws it underneath. It tucks it. So it's even harder to get at. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, take your big boy and put him at the bottom of your library like, and we'll see him again. Uh, never. That's a cool god eternal. Okay, bye. Okay, bye. <laughs> uh, next up, uh, Tomebound Lich. He's one generic, one blue, and one black for a 1 3 zombie wizard with death touch and lifelink. And whenever <laughs> uh, he enters the battlefield or deals combat damage to a player, you get to draw a card, then discard a card. So this is another one of those cards he at least, that loots. He at least replaces himself. Yeah. Um, and I think we're going to see Grixis, Grixis dis- self-discard. It's possible. <laughs> I think it'll be an interesting deck, and I think he's a 3-drop 1-3 with light pink and death touch, and death touch yeah. is always scary. So he's a terrifying blocker to swing into. Yep. And then he's going to at least replace himself if he doesn't attack. Who has a decent size butt, mind you. Like, yeah. I understand that his front end's kind of small, but I mean, he can block a lot of the little dudes. Well, it doesn't matter how big his front size is as long he as it's one. He just has to deal one damage, but I'm saying he can block <laughs> a lot of the little dudes. Yeah. Yeah, so he, can, he can chump block he, all day he long. He can has the potential to put in some work. Yeah, absolutely. Next up. Yarok the Desecrated. So I think this is our last, like, commander legend. I think this is the last card we're going to go over today. Yeah, so Yarok is a two mana. Uh, it, it's a five mana, three five. It's two and salt eye colors, so black, green, and blue. It's got death touch, lifelink. And then if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability or of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. There were five, three triggers in that sentence. Yes. He is a panharmonicon on a death-touching, life-linking stick. Panharmonicon on crack on a death-touching, life-linking stick because he doesn't just care about creatures or artifacts. It's everything entering it's play. It's permanence. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, he's just really good. Yeah. He's definitely going in my salt like commander deck. Oh, ab- absolutely. I would put him at the head of that. Maybe. <laughs> we'll have to see. Uh, yeah, he's just really good, because he's, yeah, panharmonicon on crack, on a stick. Yeah, absolutely. With death touch and, and life lifelink. Link. Very nice. Yeah, and that's, uh, all the spoilers we're going over today, guys. Yep. So, I hope you had fun with us. That's some of our favorite cards that are coming out in Core 2020. Yeah. What are we talking about next week? Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be talking more uh, Core 2020 stuff. Not spoilers, though, uh, because next week is a pre-release week. It so is. we will be doing, uh, like we did last time, a pre-release primer. So, like, what you should look for, what you should look forward to, and yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you can catch us next time at Move to Combat on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here at Twitch TV slash Move to Combat. 
You can tweet us at at to combat or email us at move to combat podcast at gmail.com. If you like our intro music, you can find that at soundcloud.com slash James Scheib. That's J A M E S S H A I E B. That's me. And uh, you can download every every song I've ever made there. And some stuff sucks, some stuff's good, whatever. If you like <laughs> role playing games, please. If you like role playing games, you can check out our sister podcast, which is Brave Yet Stupid, on Saturdays at six thirty. As I think it's what it is, a Saturdays. <laughs> I don't remember. I run the podcast. I don't remember. Oh, no. no one knows. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Well, check out Brave Yet Stupid if you like role-playing games. We're we're actually uh, testing a game that we've developed private privately, like our own group of friends. So uh, give it a shot. That's it for tonight. I hope everybody had a good time listening as much as we had broadcasting. Have a good night. Have a nice night, guys. Have a good one, guys.